and solutions, I think I think you're going to feel not only much more clear and in control of this process, but confident and aligned with what you truly want. So I'd like to start by telling you a brief story. I grew up in New York City and went to an extremely competitive high school. Just to give you an idea, I had five to six hours of homework a night and felt really oppressed by it all. I did well despite that, but I couldn't wait to get out of there and go to college. My senior year in high school was truly bizarre. My classmates and their parents got together and offered me cash to withdraw my applications after I was admitted early to Yale. Apart from the unsettling feeling that gave me, I had really not decided if I really wanted to attend that school. I wanted to see what other options opened up in the spring for me. And as it turned out, I ended up going not to Yale, but to Princeton instead. But this experience left me feeling really ill at ease. And when I was planning my son's education, I was determined that he would not suffer this kind of toxic academic environment that I had endured, which I didn't feel served me in the long run. So I wanted my son to be happy, of course, first and foremost, but also successful and how to strike the right balance. So the difficulty started with choosing a high school for him. He went back and forth between competitive, well-known prep schools and a small, unknown school that prioritized love of learning and independent projects. And I realized that either way there would be trade-offs, but in the end, I chose the small school where my son found his passion. And, you know, given that I'd been an interviewer for many years for Princeton, as well as a teacher who wrote letters of recommendations and gave college essay guidance, you would think it would have been easy for me to guide my son through his college applications, right? Not at all. So I hired a colleague to work with him. And after many months at the end of a surprisingly difficult process, he got into an Ivy League school. But that's not what he chose. He made what some of you might think was a very unexpected choice. And I'll tell you about it at the end of the webinar. So what I want you to know is that I have been where you are. Although I knew the system well, when my son applied to college, I had complicated feelings. Like many parents, I, I was vulnerable to confusion, to frustration, to fear, but I did learn something important. I discovered that my son, like all of you here today, was facing a threefold problem when applying to college. So number one, the increased competition. Number two, the complexity of the application process. And number three, the rising cost of college. Now, what does this challenge look like in practice? First, let's consider the competitiveness of the college application process. If you were a Texas student in the 90s and graduated in the top 10% of 20% of your graduating class, you were automatically admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. Today, you'll need to graduate in the top 6% of your class. If you were applying to Yale in the 90s, you had an 18% chance of admission. Now it's under 5%. And 70% of USC applicants were admitted in the 90s, but in 2022, it's now under 12%. And maybe some of you read a recent Wall Street Journal article about a young woman with an SAT score of 1550, a GPA of 3.95, phenomenal extracurricular and leadership positions, who applied to top tier schools and, and was not admitted to any of them. So there's no doubt that college admissions today is super competitive. Now let's look at the complexity of the application process. So 20 years ago, you might have applied to one or two colleges and the process was clear, simple, and straightforward. Now, because of all the many moving parts of the application, students are applying to as many as eight to 15 schools for my students. So there's a lot to stay on top of. And to give you a glimpse into the complexity, Take a look at all the elements that need to be in place for students to have optimal merit scholarship and admission results. 
Recently, a friend of mine was telling me about the ordeal of helping his son apply to college last fall. The numbers of different essays for each college, the completely different online applications to fill in SAT prep, different deadlines, recommendations for honors programs, and on and on. This was a ton of work and created months of tension with his son. So clearly, this complexity needs to be simplified. Now, after the complexity and the competitiveness of the college admissions, the fact is that college has gotten incredibly expensive. If you please look at this graph, it really illustrates how the cost of college tuition has exploded. The red line here on the bottom is the rate of inflation, and as you can see, the black line on the top is the rate of increase in college tuition. Clearly, college tuition has massively outpaced inflation for decades now. Private colleges can cost up to $77,000 per year, while in-state tuition for public schools can cost up to $28,000 per year. But here's the good news. Merit scholarships can be worth tens of thousands of dollars and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So how do we do it? There here are three quick success stories which illustrate how we guide students to gain a competitive edge, simplify the complexity, and maximize scholarship to reduce the cost of college. Let's start with Tony. When we began working together in early 10th grade, Tony had high A's and an SAT score in the mid-1500s. He was stellar in math, so his teachers and family were naturally pushing him toward engineering. But after talking with Tony, he made it very clear that engineering was not what he wanted. However, and this was the game changer, we discovered that he had a significant talent and passion for art as well as STEM. So he was matched to a local art mentor and summer program to develop a portfolio, the portfolio that he could then include in his application. So exploring his interest in visual arts and combining this with his talent in math led Tony to discover a passion for architecture. And this discovery made all the difference because it re made Tony really stand out. Why? Because now Tony had a story to tell and nothing will make you stand out from the crowd more than having your own story that, ge that demonstrates genuine passion and growth. So to summarize, Tony discovered his passion. We, he simplified the application process, and he was guided to a clear major and career path he loved, architecture. And Tony secured a $100,000 scholarship to Tulane, which he turned down. And then by curating his art portfolio and targeting his essays to align with architecture and his new vision for himself, Tony found a competitive edge. And the result was he was admitted to Rice University, his first choice, where he has now finished a successful freshman year. And in this way, Tony solved the threefold problem of college admissions. But not all of us are straight A students like Tony. Some of us get A's and B's. We might have a down year. We might get sick or be in a competitive high school, but we're still ambitious. So that was Ellen. Ellen had a B average from a competitive high school, but was confident about thriving in a selective college. We discovered that her GPA had significantly improved over the three years of high school through her hard work. When she got Bs, it motivated her to get tutoring and find a college professor as a mentor, and she kept signing up for really challenging classes. She also rose to a leadership position in yearbook and got a summer internship in a startup incubator to explore a major in business. But how was she going to pull all these threads together to showcase her accomplishments? Ellen worked to tell her story in a compelling way, as a journey of growth and responsibility. She demonstrated through her essays and applications how she learned from setbacks and how these setbacks led her to develop and improve. In fact, they became assets. And maybe you or your child are like Ellen, you discovered a specific passion halfway or to the end of high school. Maybe you began to excel by the end of junior year, or maybe you're a straight A student who has a clear major in mind from the start. Either way, you may not recognize what is exceptional about you, but everybody has a powerful story to tell. You need to tell your story in a memorable way. 
your passions, your challenges, your successes. So to summarize, for Ellen, she simplified the application process by keeping accountable and breaking down the long list of tasks into small steps. She submitted standout applications and she eventually received 12 scholarship offers ranging from $20,000 to $100,000. She gained a competitive edge by pulling all her academic and extracurricular experiences together into a compelling story in the essays and interviews. So despite her GPA, she was admitted as a business major to Emory University, her first choice. So Ellen solved the threefold problem of college admissions. Now, Grace's story is slightly different. She had an A, B average, no test scores, had a remarkable singing talent she needed to showcase. So what was the solution to the threefold problem of admissions for Grace? First, to simplify the process by keeping her organized and on task through spreadsheets in an application tracking system. Second, to keep costs down by optimizing all aspects of the applications and tailoring the college list in Grace's case. And in her case, she was awarded scholarships ranging from 80,000 to 199,000. And as Grace was a singer, she gained a competitive edge by curating her vocal submissions, her reel, and helping her get admitted to the super selective summer Grammy camp. And in the end, she was accepted to her first choice, California Institute of the Arts. And even turn, having turned down a $199,000 scholarship from Columbia College, Chicago. So the three students we discussed, Tony, Ellen, and Grace, were all success stories, but very different one from another. Yet for all these students, they solved the problems of competitiveness, complexity, and cost of college. And through these case studies, we hope you've gotten some valuable tips on what to prioritize in college planning. And before we answer your questions, which is going to be the main focus of today's session, let's first answer the most common one, which is how you can work with us. So before we give you the three simple options, here is our track record. For 2022 application cycle, my students received over $2 million in scholarships and our average total amount of scholarships per student over four years was $182,000. So our fees in that case were paid for many times over and the return on investment for families was very high. In this same application cycle, students we worked with were admitted to some of the most selective colleges in the country, including Stanford, Dartmouth, University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, as well as excellent schools such as UC Riverside, Penn State, Ohio State, Texas A&M, and more. And best of all, we were also, these schools were also the right fit for those students. So if you want to gain a competitive edge, simplify the application process and keep costs down, like the hundreds of students we've helped ace college admissions, here are the simple three options for working with us. So option one is for eighth to 10th grade students. It's uh, early talent development, and we have, in that case, time to identify the uh, students' talents, discover their passions, and make sure they're really on track. And this option also maximizes admissions and scholarships results when they apply to college. We help optimize their GPA, test scores, extracurriculars, and summer planning. And packages start at 1997. Option two is for 11th to 12th grade students. Our two-year A-list package will give you a competitive edge, simplify the complex application process, will help optimize essays, SAT prep and testing, and as well as applications and summer planning, including demonstrated interest score for each college. This package costs $19,997 with the ability to provide some level of customization depending on your situation. Now option three uh, is more affordable. It's also a two-year college advisor package. This um, is the same as the A-list package, but instead of working with me, you work with one of uh, the advisors that we have handpicked and trained. 
and the cost for this is $79.97. So if you're serious about working with us, please sign up for our free discovery session and bring your questions. And students, please have both parents with you, so sign up for when they are available. Parents, please bring your spouse. And Karen, our wonderful moderator, will drop the sign up link in the chat now. And um, in this session, again, this session is designed to explore our packages and answer your questions. Students, please bring your parents, so sign up for when they can attend. Parents, please bring your spouse. So before I answer your questions, I do want to finish the story about my son. So basically, uh, at the end of his application process, uh, he did in fact get into an Ivy League uh, school, but that is not what he chose. Instead, after a lot of research, investigation, deep reflection, and a visit to campus, my son chose an amazing school, Carleton College in Minnesota, which you may not have heard of, but turns out employers, graduate schools, and prestigious fellowship boards know very well. It was by far a better choice for him than the Ivy. At Carleton, my son got more attention, classes were more targeted, his professors advocated for him. He stood out, and after his freshman year, he was awarded the Orion Mission Internship at NASA and a second Orion Mission Internship at NASA the following summer. Today, he's in graduate school at an Ivy League college and tells me that in retrospect, although some disagreed with his college choice, this was absolutely the right decision for him. And best of all for me as a mom, he's happy and thriving. So parents and students, this is a really important message I have for you. You may be anxious right now, but I can assure you that there are many roads to success. Please remember that college is not a destination. The college application process can help you begin to discover a sense of purpose, a great first step in designing a life of meaning and financial stability. And that's what I wish for all of you. So I am going to be very happy to answer your questions now. Uh, I will ask um, our great moderators to paste the link in the chat again. Uh, if you're serious about working with us, students, please sign up, bring your parents, and parents, please bring your spouse. So um, I do want to uh, share my screen again, and uh, I am happy now to answer questions. I'm looking forward to seeing what you, what you all are, are, uh, are thinking about right now. So um, to go to veterinary school, you can't go directly. Um, well, in the US, before veterinary school, before medical school, there are pre-med pre uh, course sequences that need to be taken. So there's certain requirements that the colleges want to see. Now, there are some direct admit programs, uh, for example, for medical school, where you get a bachelor's and then you get guaranteed admission to medical school if you have a certain average. Those uh, programs tend to be incredibly uh, incredibly competitive. And um, generally speaking, to apply, it's a good idea to think about it early. It's really for people who have known for a really long time that they want to go on these medical paths. And then you would uh, design your high school experience really to be in a great position to be able to apply directly. Um, for the person with a 3.4 GPA, it is, a, is it a four, five, or six point scale? So the examples were on a four point scale, I believe. Uh, when we receive an acceptance letter uh, from college, how much time do we have to respond? It's a good question. So generally speaking, uh, you have until May 1st, May 1st of your senior year to respond. Uh, generally, colleges will set that date as the last day you have to tell them whether you want to be admitted. Um, now, you want to enroll. Uh, now, 
you may get your admission results very early. You may get, depending if it's rolling admissions or if it's an early decision school or an early action school, uh, I've had students uh, who submitted their applications toward the end of August who've already received uh, letters of acceptance from schools that have rolling admissions. So it really depends like what the time lag, it depends when you submit those applications, then you'll know, you know, kind of how much time. Sometimes for this extremely selective schools, even if you submitted uh, this month to your uh, college, you'd still have to wait probably till April, March or April to find out. Um, okay, so what fraction of our students in this most recent cycle received less than $10,000 in scholarships? Nobody, because our scholarships ranged from 12,000 all the way to full rides of 276,000. Um, do you just help for scholarships because we already have a counselor? No, uh, we help with a strategic planning for um, better admission results as well. And also to help students really uh, decide what kind of majors are right for them, what kind of careers are right for them. Some students know super early in the process and other students really don't. And there are many very um, useful and win-win ways of figuring that out. And some of them are interest and uh, strengths assessments but others are participating in internships uh, if we have enough time and we're working with students early in high school. Uh, we can help them apply to internships, to research programs, um, to design a personal project. There's so many ways for students to find out, you know, what direction to go in. Um, and so it, all of those can be, it depends when we can get started, when you, and when you are starting on that process. So um, I've read articles stating the importance of test scores uh, dropping and by 2024 will not be as important to most universities due to missing out on many students, et cetera, that might, might not be great test takers. Yes, so that's been the trend, right? Um, the University of California system, UCLA, UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, Berkeley, etc. They don't even look at test scores anymore. However, however, the vast majority of colleges still look at test scores. So what we recommend to students, and whether you are in early high school, whether you are in 11th grade, um, what we recommend is for you to be very wise about this. Uh, try to maximize your test score. And these, by the way, these, these tests, they're not, they're not good predictors. They're not real predictors of your abilities or your college readiness. They are going to test how much prep you've done. That is what they're gonna test. Now, of course, there's some great test takers that come in the first time and ace the test. But the vast majority of students can increase their uh, test results by, you know, for the SAT, those who work with their tutors, by 100 points, 150 points or more. And for the ACT, between, you know, four and six points. I've even seen students increase by, by eight points if you have enough lead time. So what we recommend as a policy even for the colleges that are test optional, is you try to do the best you can to prepare, and then once the, your, your best scores are in, then we can decide whether you're gonna submit them or not. And that should be on a school-by-school -school basis, looking at the 50th percentile, a mid-range of SAT scores, you, or ACT scores. You wanna be at the top of that range. Um, are all scholarships competitive? Well, most scholarships are competitive. Uh, there is, it depends, kind of merit scholarships are going to be competitive. However, you know, the colleges are uh, awarding, they are discounting their tuition. So what we do with students is we're looking at two things. If merit scholarships are super important, and that's usually for families earning between um, kind of 80,000 and 350,000. That's where the merit scholarships really come in and make a difference. 
Uh, if it's below 80,000, then you're gonna have financial aid support that's need-based. Uh, but between those 80 and 350,000, uh, there is there are going to be some schools that are more likely to award merit aid. So when we're working with students, we do two things. We identify the schools that are more likely to offer the merit aid, and we maximize the student's profile so that uh, their profile is the most attractive it can be to the colleges. Telling that story in a compelling way, bringing together all the elements, um, having a, sometimes having a portfolio, kind of depends on the school and the program. But what we want is to do those two things. If we're just looking at one side of the equation, we're not kind of throwing everything we've got at the uh, issue of cost. We want to bring that cost down through as many different uh, ways as possible. Um, so AP versus dual enrollment, which one of the two stands out more? So, you know, this is the thing. Um, don't think of it in, in, um, in generic terms or in general terms. The colleges are looking at applicants in the context of their high schools, right? So if your high school offers, there are high schools that offer, you know, five APs and it's like it, it's only senior year or, or half junior and half senior, uh, and they offer a lot of dual enrollment, then, you know, it's, it's a completely different situation than if a college is offering, you know, quite a lot of APs from the beginning. What you want to do is, um, you know, the dual enrollment, part of the, part of the issue of dual enrollment is that if you're looking at it as a way of getting credit toward college, um, the, pr the problem with that is that sometimes a local community college where you're getting that dual enrollment, that credit is not going to carry over. Uh, to uh, schools outside of your local area. Sometimes you're going to get that credit to a local college, but it, but it, that may not carry over to a college that's for, you know out of state. So it's it's a question of figuring out what is the most important for you, and also what your context is, what the context of your academic achievement within uh, what the school actually offers and what your goals are. So package for current 12th graders, it's the, uh, it, it's the college advisor package that we talked about at the end. It's uh, 7997 and absolutely feel free to connect with us uh, through that link that Karen um, and Carla have uh, kindly put into the uh, chat. Maybe you guys could put it back in. That would be fantastic. Um, so then I remember when you told Tony's story, you said you matched him with a mentor that had some correlation with his interest. How would I get access to a mentor of my own and explore my interests? That's a great question. So there are many different ways um, to identify mentors. Uh, sometimes it's through local nonprofits, right? Uh, it depends, you know, if, um, if you can work with somebody out of state and they, uh, there, there are mentors who work for free and then there are mentors who do, you know, it's their time. So sometimes they are charging. Uh, there are organizations that put you together with mentors. Uh, what I would do is first try to identify what areas you're interested in. And once you have that clarity about what kind of area you'd like to deepen, whether it's a personal project, whether it's scientific research, then you'll know where to look. For example, some local colleges are absolutely great sources to connect with professors in certain fields and do research internships with them. Um, there ha there, every year there, there are professors that, that do that. The reason that sometimes we look further afield into mentors that um, are uh, do need you know to be compensated is that 
there are only so many professors in your local college, right? But I definitely, if that's something that is of interest, if research is of interest, that can be a great way to go, or nonprofits that are connected to your area of interest. It all depends on your focus. Um, okay, and then my 10th grader is a gifted learner, an excellent student, but doesn't know what she wants to do for a major. Yeah. So there are, um, there are students that I call the Renaissance kids and Renaissance kids have a variety of interests. They're usually talented on a lot of different things. And the question is, so how do we help students like that focus? Now, what the good news is about um, students like that and the cu current landscape uh, of higher education is that there are many, um, interdisciplinary majors now available in colleges. So rather than trying to um, restrict a student like that and say, oh, well, you know, you have to decide if it's STEM or you have to decide if it's humanities or you have to, you know, uh, there, for example, one example that comes to mind is uh, the BX, uh, the BSA uh, or BXA uh, major at Carnegie Mellon where you can do, I had a student a couple of years ago that did art and neuroscience. She was really strong in art and really interested in neuroscience and was able to combine those. Um, in terms of careers, you know, you might think, oh, well, what is that going to lead to? The point is that the more a student is engaged uh, in personal projects in college, there has been um, shown to be a correlation between how well they do, how connected they are in college, and then outcomes after college. So we want to show students that there are many, many options, and there are many ways to combine uh, their interests. Uh, somebody like that might end up doing, um, you know, graphic design for, um, uh, for scientific papers. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways to uh, combine interests in order to find careers where students will really thrive and be happy. Uh, but another answer to your question is there are interest and strength assessments, which I do give students, and we have had a really good success at helping students identify. So a 10th grade student, there's also a lot of time in terms of planning for the summer. So um, the summer is a great time for students to explore and to get feedback from the real world through internships, through mentorships, through uh, research programs and other opportunities to see, do I like this field? Is it, you know, am I suited to it? Um, is this an environment I want to work in? So it goes beyond just the kind of shadowing, which can be a little bit, it can be interesting, but sometimes uh, maybe a little bit superficial, right? Just following somebody around for a week. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we kind of tend to support more engaged opportunities for students over the summer, for example. Um, yes, yeah, so the uh for like uh, information about our two-year uh, uh al application process uh how do you get more info just sign up for one of our uh sessions please go into the chat and you should find the link and maybe carla or karen you could put that back in most schools i have looked into do not require sats or act therefore just focusing on sats or act is a good idea again kind of links to the question to that other question i answered earlier um, we want to give you every advantage right so whether a school now some programs really even before covid were test optional uh, and, and examples of this, sometimes art programs or um, audition-based programs, right, for performing artists, that may be less important. However, sometimes for merit scholarships, colleges are still, if you have a competitive SAT or ACT score, it will only help you. But if you have limited time and uh, you're not a great test taker, you know, then we have to see on a case by case basis. I don't like to give generic advice because I think it has to be very strategic and personalized to who you are, but I hope that that uh, helps a little bit. 
Um, so do you recommend colleges in the U.S. or outside of the U.S.? Well, it's interesting. Right now we've got um, a trend. There are a lot of Americans who are studying abroad and get, getting their bachelor's abroad. Um, we've helped a lot of students, uh, you know, go to study in England or even English speaking programs in Europe that give now a bachelor's degree. Some of the reasons for that is some of those programs are less expensive than college in the U.S., some of them. And um, also there are other reasons, of course, like um, getting a lot out of being in a, in a situation abroad. So there, 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 there are benefits that go beyond the cost. Uh, Pre-dental, yeah, this is, a, this is the kind of thing that, you know, there are going to be lists, you know, you can find lists uh, of the best programs for X, Y, and Z. You can look at um, U.S. News and World Report rankings. There are pros and cons to that. Uh, the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Uh, some schools are very question the validity of some of those rankings. So it depends. The more more important than what the best school is is what is the best school for you. So the more you can pinpoint what kind of environment is it that will be most supportive of me that where I will thrive, where I will do well, where I will be actively involved in the college community rather than focusing on what the best program is. Now, luckily in this country, we've got, uh, we're so fortunate, we've got many, many, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of, of excellent programs. So that's how I would, uh, I, would, I would go about it. Yes, we do have a, a package for essays for current seniors. So absolutely, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, book a meeting with us and we can explore those. Um, tips for starting your essays. Okay, so the essays are a wonderful place to tell your story. That's what they're all about. So um, what you need to do really for essays is um, try not to guess what colleges want, but focus on what do I want them to know about me? What is it in my application that has not been included in my transcript, in my list of activities, in my test scores that I want them to know about me? What is my story? And how can I tell that in the most compelling way possible? So I think if you start from that, now sometimes a prompt will also be very exciting. You know, you'll say, oh, I really want to write about this one prompt. That's great. Some students get very inspired by the prompts. But if not, then focus on telling your story and what, um, what characteristics about you, with examples, of course, uh, to illustrate uh, in your life times where you have demonstrated those qualities qualities that you will be able to contribute to the college community. So um, yes, taking AP classes help my odds. Well, this is the thing. It's not AP per se, it's more rigor, the rigor of the curriculum. Colleges want to know if students have challenged themselves. Um, you know, a, getting, a, a you know, kind of breezing through high school because you haven't challenged yourself, um, that, that record is not going to be evaluated in the same way as a student who has taken more challenging classes. Like the example I gave of Ellen, even though she had, you know, quite a lot of Bs and she um, went to the super competitive high school, she still challenged herself. She kept, you know, she kept, she took organic chemistry, for example, one year, even though it was really hard for her, but she really was interested in the class. And um, she, she, she got um, a mentor and support to help her do as well as she could. So I wouldn't focus like on APs per se. Um, now, I know that the AP system for some schools is such that when a student takes APs, it bumps up their GPA. That's the reality, right? So we've got to be strategic, okay? Be strategic, be smart, but always put your well-being first. Your well-being, because what we don't want is burned out students who get to college and drop out the first semester, no matter how great the college is, no matter what their GPA has been in high school. I've seen this happen. 
So we want to balance, we want to be sure that, uh, you know, the most important thing, because when you have that well-being, when you have that solid foundation of health, then everything is possible. Otherwise, it becomes very, very difficult. Can you get into a good college with an SAT score uh, of 1150? Again, those SAT scores are not, there's no kind of, yes, a perfect score is a great score, but um, it depends on which colleges you're applying to. So you want to look at the 50th percentile or the mid-range of the colleges you're interested in. If you uh, are at the top of that 50th percentile for that school, then you submit the scores. If not, then I would not submit the scores. Um, okay, a bad, what do you recommend for a student who's had a bad junior year and saw their GPA drop? Yeah, well, what's good about that is what you need to do is, um, first of all, you'll have a chance to explain to the college is what happened. There's an additional information section on the on the uh, Common App. There are other places for you to be able to do that. So you want to be, you know, just just uh, be honest and say kind of what happened. A lot of students have been very impacted by COVID um, and have seen their grades drop. Have had. Um, you know, mental health repercussions as a result of that. This is well known. The Surgeon General of the United States uh, contacted um, non educational nonprofits and asked them to help with this crisis, right? So it's a known thing. So don't worry, you know, say, say tell your story. This is part of your story. But then, you know, what you wanna do is try to show, certainly in the senior year, that you um, have been able to turn the situation around as much as possible. Uh, sometimes if the record is really affected, uh, it might make sense to take a gap year because then you'd apply with all of your 12th grade grades. So there are many ways of, uh, of, of, of doing that. Um, okay. So then I'm a current junior, when should I apply for college and university? So the actual submission of the applications will happen beginning in the month of August between your junior and senior year. Uh, we recommend that students get started on essays in their junior year so that they are not overburdened over in the summer between junior, senior, and then during the fall. Now the deadlines are much later, the deadlines are like January or sometimes early uh, early uh, deadlines are like November, beginning of November of the senior year. So there are students who wait and do all the work their senior year, but it's tough. It's tough for them to do that. So if you are a junior, then um, I would say get started, get your college list together and um, all of that uh, earlier than later. And you know, if you work with us, we have a process we take students through. Uh, that's really step by step to minimize the complexity and the and the um, to increase uh, scholarships and chances of admission. Okay, uh, as a sophomore, what should you do in order to maximize your chances of getting scholarships and admitted to colleges? Yes, so there are many things you can do. Right um, at the top of the list for colleges is always rigor of the curriculum. Have you challenged yourself and um, and then, you know, how, how well have you done, right, academically? But really to tell that story, which is the heart of the process for um, competitive applicants, right? That's how you make an impact. That's how you make, a, a, have an effect on your, um, on, on the attractiveness of your applications. So what can you do? Well, you can do a lot of things. Uh, let's start with extracurriculars. What's important is depth, not breadth, right? It's better to do a few things as deeply as you can than to do 10 different things. Some students think that if they just check off every single box and participate in every single club, that they're going to um, increase their chances of admission and scholarships. It doesn't work like that. And let me explain why. Uh, 
colleges, there's, it used to be that colleges were looking for well-rounded students. Now what they want is well-rounded classes. They, they want to create their freshman class out of very specific kinds of students who are each going to contribute their unique, distinctive point of view and experience to that well-rounded freshman class, if that makes sense. Um, what you, so what you want to do is be in line with who you are. Find out more about yourself. If you have clarity, that's great. Apply to some uh, programs in the summer and get involved in extracurriculars that really help you uh, first of all, understand more about yourself, but develop some skills that are going to be um, transferable to your uh, college path. And some of them can be academic skills. Uh, some of them are things like those soft skills like teamwork and um, communication and critical thinking. So, uh, you know, if a student is very interested in STEM, that might look like research internships. Um, if a student is, uh, you know, kind of more of a renaissance uh, kid, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there might be a variety of different things. It might be study. It might be a personal project that has uh, impact. What we, you know, think about it in terms of impact. If you, if you focus on impact, impact on the community, impact on your school, how are you contributing? If you think about it using your talent, to benefit your community locally or globally, uh, that can be the leading factor to help you decide what to focus on. But the important thing again is depth. That's what's going to help. Um, would it be a good idea to jump into college a few months after graduation or wait longer? What is the recommended time we wait before starting college? Um, I think you're talking about gap year. So, uh, if you graduate, you know, in the in the spring of your senior year, and then you start college in the fall of that following year, that's a few months out. If you decide that you want to take more time between the end of high school and the beginning of college, that's absolutely valid. There are a lot of people that do that. Um, we have helped many students put together uh, wonderful gap years. Um, gap year programs, but it has to be well organized, I would say. Um, okay, how much a demonstration of leadership is necessary? Does playing on the varsity team, for example, count? How about Peace Corps, um, like service in the summer? Yeah, so, you know, leadership is great because it shows uh, involvement, right? Um, but, you know, what I don't want you all to do is to try to kind of in some way kind of figure out what colleges want. What I'm telling you is what they want is what you already have. You just haven't developed it yet, possibly to the extent that you could. So rather than saying, you know, is it varsity team? Is it leadership? Start with you. Ask yourself, what is most meaningful to me? What do I enjoy the most? Now, sometimes students like all sorts of things, right? And then it's harder because um, uh, then you kind of want to do a little bit of everything. I understand that. But really, make the focus uh, what it is that you is most meaningful to you and how you can contribute to making a difference in your community uh, or, or further out. Um, I have two sons, one's a ninth grader. I'll definitely, okay, enroll him. My, another son is 12th grader working on his college application. What top three tips would you give him when writing essays? Okay, this is a good question. So, you know, top three tips, I would say, again, as I said for the previous student who asked about essays, it's an opportunity to tell colleges something that they don't already know about you. Right? So what they know is what's going to be on the transcript. What they know is what's going to be in the um, list of activities. But you have uh, some very strong qualities as a person, ways that you have 
uh, developed your uh, strengths that have been beneficial to your teams, to your family, to your community. Um, and I'm not just talking about teamwork, right? Sometimes it's a leadership position, sometimes it's a mentorship, but there are different ways that students can express that when they're writing a college essay. And it's, it's just really important to tell those stories, to be super specific. So I would say top three tips, um, focus on what's really meaningful. Use a lot of specific examples, right? We want every statement to be backed up by an example. Statement example. You say, you, you, you write an idea, show us, right? Show us, don't tell us. That would be my third uh, one. And, and then maybe last, I would say, let that essay sit and then go back to it, right? Don't submit the, even if you feel like you have a final draft, let it sit and work on it a little bit uh, so that it really, uh, you, you, you have that sense, you know, this is the best that I, this is the best that I'm capable of. You want that feeling of accomplishment when you submit those applications. Okay, so I'm in my junior year. I just transferred to a private school, struggling a bit, but I feel I can do better soon. How would you suggest I boost my portfolio? Okay, so I think it's important to start with you, right? Uh, you, you're, you've just transferred to another school. It's really important for us not to kind of, you know, that transition is already a lot, right? Transferring to a new school requires a lot of energy, a lot of adaptation. So I would say, you know, it's always about what can I do for my community? There's a very famous speech, Kennedy speech about, you know, what can, what can I do for my country, right? So it's, uh, that's what, what you need to be thinking when you come into a new community like that. Because if you're thinking in those terms, you know, um, being there, being the person that volunteers if the teacher needs something or uh, seeing there's a need, uh, you know, it also helps us get through those difficult transitions and difficult times when we try to see how we can be of service. And that shifts the conversation away from, you know, that narrow tunnel vision of checking off all those boxes for college admission and putting the shift back, the focus back on, you know, well-being. And well-being starts with um, being uh, available. Uh, it's not only to to others, but but to yourself. And so you know, I think that uh, you may be asking a lot of yourself, um, once you've done that, that portfolio is going to tell itself, right? See what, what is needed around you and how you can be a friend and how you can be a support to your school community. And that will help you also transition into that school community. Um, if the college is offering early admission and commitment for early admission, do we have to commit? what if we get a better offer yeah so if it's early decision uh it is binding um you know if a school finds out that you've applied early decision to a few places and people have done that uh, sometimes if they find out they will they will uh, deny admission across the board you don't want to be in that position right so if it's early decision, it's binding. And so if you're applying early decision, it means it's your top choice school. And it also means that whatever um, merit scholarship or other scholarship they offer you, you're not gonna have too much wiggle room in terms of negotiation, but it might boost your chances of admission. In some schools, uh, applying early decision boosts your chances significantly. So there are a lot of questions, you know, to, 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 to look at with that. Do you assist with overseas school like Oxford and Cambridge? Absolutely. We have a specialist on our team who's British and who has helped many students apply to the UK. Um, in her personal essay, my daughter's mentioning her religion and ethnic background. Is it a bad idea given um, admissions, yeah, possible prejudices? Yeah, you know, I understand your feelings about this. I think it's a very personal decision how much to reveal. Um, I think 
you know, always start with the authentic story. If a student is saying something about their religion and why it's very meaningful and how they've supported, uh, you know, their, their, their religious community or, you know, again, it, it should, it should be always about the student's uh, authentic path and what matters the most to them. Um, I wouldn't try to second guess too much because you don't know. Uh, but you know, if if the if the story is really about why that religion or that why that um, uh, path has been important to that student, I don't see it being a problem. Um, what if I'm doing early action, but I'm taking the SAT after the application date? Yeah, so that you should check with the colleges. Generally, they want the SAT of the month, like for November 1st, it's usually October is the last one they'll accept. But, you know, it's worth checking with specific schools to see if they're a bit flexible, okay? But, but don't count on it. Don't count on it. What are good scores? No such thing as good scores. It's relative to the 50th percentile of the colleges you are applying to. Of course, a perfect score is a good score, right? But most of us are not getting that. So we're, we're looking at that 50th percentile. Um, okay, above 350K, then that's usually, unless you know there are a lot of children in the household, uh, generally, you know, the, that's going to be um, less kind of um, applicable for merit scholarships. Although, uh, you know, it's not it's not a black and white question. So if you're you know um, if you need more on that, you can always contact me. Um, yeah. So with an interest in a medical career, is it better to apply as a chemistry or biology undergrad? Uh, Large, small universities best best for progression to medical school. When should submissions be made to colleges if the student is a junior? Yes. So that's a lot of questions, but um, and we're kind of toward the end. But um, the medical career, uh, um, when you apply to medical school, you don't have to have majored in a science. You have to have. Uh, taken the pre-med requirements. A lot of uh, students applying to medical school have majored in a science. So rather, again, than trying to second guess what is going to be better for medical school, it should be what is most aligned with my interests, right? What is most likely to be the most fascinating thing for me, the most exciting major for me? And then you'll get pre-med guidance to know what those requirements are for medical school. And large or small, that's not going to matter. What's going to matter is how well you do in college. So it's better to be, um, do very, very well at a smaller school, uh, you know, with ha having really great grades and great MCAT scores and applying to medical school with great examples of, you know, research and um, volunteering rather than just saying it's got to be a bigger school. Uh, and then when should submissions be made to colleges if a student is a junior? Uh, we try to help students uh, submit kind of toward the end of the summer between junior and senior year, beginning of very beginning of the fall. Uh, some of the colleges are on rolling admissions, so earlier can be better in the sense that for rolling admissions, they are uh, allocating spaces in the freshman class and merit scholarships on a first come first serve basis. Okay, so um, we're kind of at time. Uh, I, I see that we have a lot of a lot of questions. So um, I would be, you know, delighted to uh, connect with you offline. Uh, some of you um, are going to sign up or have signed up uh, because you're very interested in working with us. Um, in that, um, uh, in that, uh, the, the link that the moderators have um, put in the chat. But if you know you have a question that I have not answered, um, it, please feel free to reach out uh, by email, and if I can, I will answer your question. So thank you so much for being here today. I wish you all joy in your learning and joy in your life.